Well, I invite you this morning to open to the book of Romans. And we have been on an expository journey through Romans, doing expository preaching. That is where the preacher studies the text for its intended meaning and takes that meaning and explains it to the congregation and applies it with the Holy Spirit's work in your heart, applies it to your own mind, to your own heart, and to your life. And so this morning, we are now in Romans chapter 1, looking at this very vital paragraph, verses 24 through 27. I've entitled the sermon, The Second Sinful Exchange. We looked at the first one last week, that was idolatry. This one is the second one listed, homosexuality. Homosexuality. This is such a big issue in our world today, and it's growing Every day, every year. And so let's just look at what the text says. And I want to open it up and explain why Paul put it here. And what he means and explains by doing that. So starting, let's pick up in verse 18. So we get the context. It's important when we study a passage to get the context of the passage. And we need to do that at least starting in verse 18. The Apostle Paul, under the... um, Under Christ, he's been sent out as an apostle to the Gentiles. He writes to the Romans, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they they knew God, they did not glorify him as the best translation there. They did not glorify him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man. And of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. So that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God... For a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts. And receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. Well, I probably don't have to tell you how much this passage is disliked by the world. I don't have to tell you how big of an issue homosexuality is in our world. In the 1960s and 70s, pornography really went mainstream with the publications and the magazines and the way that people could access that. And then the sexual revolution hit in the 60s and 70s, the gay rights movement in the late 70s. In the 80s and 90s, you had R-rated material and content being put out on TV right into people's homes. In the early 2000s, pornography went on the internet. Then homosexuality became legal and acceptable in almost every state. Then in 2015, kind of a shock for most of us, is that same-sex so-called marriage became legal in all 50 states, according to the Supreme Court case in 2015. Today, you can lose your job over holding the doctrine that I just read. Today, you can throw away your whole career, really, if you just make it clear to some companies where you stand on this issue. And if you speak the truth about this common sin, You'll be disliked by your friends, disliked by your neighbors, and pretty much disliked by the world. And that's just in the world. We're not even talking about so-called modern Christianity. The Pope, a recent Pope, has said 
things that affirm uh, same-sex relationships. The Presbyterian Church in America, the United Church of Christ, do not view monogamous same-sex relationships as sinful or immoral. You have the United Methodists about to split every time they meet over this issue of whether they should ordain uh, gays and whether they should affirm same-sex marriages. The Evangelical Lutheran Church, which we have many in this part of Texas, the largest Lutheran church body in the U.S., allows for LGBTQ plus marriage and ordination of their clergy. And if we looked at all the independent churches in America, we couldn't even count the number who are now affirming and saying how wonderful this sin is what the Bible calls it. How affirming they are of that sin. Well, in today's text, the Apostle Paul addresses the whole reason that it is so rampant in our culture today. It is so prevalent in our world today. And he connects it. This is key. He connects it with the wrath of God. So if I, if I ask you after the service two main things that you learn. It's okay if you don't take all the details and write down the Greek words and all that. But you need to know the Bible's against the sin of homosexuality. And it's part of God's wrath on mankind. That's undeniable in the text. It can't be brushed away. It can't be dismissed. If we're Christians, we have to hold to Scripture. And this is what Scripture says. We need to speak the truth in love. And we need to hold firm to what the Bible teaches. So what does this passage teach us? Well, in this text, the Apostle Paul addresses the reason that homosexuality is so prevalent. And he tells us in verse 18 that God's wrath has been revealed. And he says it's against all ungodliness. So he's not just talking about homosexuality, but all sins. He's going to mention different sins throughout this whole chapter. But he says all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men. That's why God's wrath is being poured out. Not in the future. There will be a future punishment. But God's wrath is upon mankind right now. Now it's not hellfire and brimstone. He's not destroying the earth. But he is pouring out his wrath. Before a coming day of wrath. Which will happen in the future. Why he told, he told us in verse 18. Because men suppress the truth. And unrighteousness. They suppress it. They know something about God and they suppress it. They push it down. They try to force it under the water so they don't have to see it. But it's like that huge beach ball. It just keeps trying to pop back up. No matter how much you push it down, it wants to come back up because it is the truth. It is there. It is truth for us to see, to hear, to believe. Well, the whole purpose of Paul saying this is because back in verse 17, he had said the righteousness of God is being revealed from faith to faith. The gospel of Christ is going out. That's how a person can be saved. Now, a lot of Christians today say, okay, great, so what? Well, the so what is the whole world is under God's wrath. And so the gospel's got to go out because it's the only way to be saved. And Paul's not ashamed of it. He's coming to Rome to proclaim it to Christians who are already saved and anyone else who will listen. He's not ashamed because it's the only way of salvation. To get God's righteousness, you have to believe in Christ. And you get the righteousness of Christ imputed to you and your sins forgiven. But the whole world is under wrath. The whole world needs to hear this message. Because they have a truth about God. Verse 19, here's the truth. That which is known about them is evident within them. God made sure that they knew this truth. He made it evident to them. How is that happening? Paul says, here's here's what's going on. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature. In other words, everyone knows there is a God. And everyone knows he's all powerful because he created all things. And they know he's divine. They know he exists. It can be clearly seen, Paul says, being understood through what has been made through creation. Everyone is without excuse. The person who lives on an island, who's never had a Bible, who's never heard the gospel, is still without excuse when it comes to sin because he saw creation, he knew there was a creator, and he suppressed that truth. He denied that truth. And he's without excuse. And they did not glorify him. All men, all men and women who've existed on this earth, they did not glorify him. 
They did not honor him. They did not give thanks. And they started to speculate about their own God. They started to come up with their own thoughts about God, their own speculations, and they created idols. They created statues. They worshiped cats and crocodiles and hippopotamus and man. And we still see that today, don't we, with so many idols of the heart in our world today. So that is why God's wrath has been poured out. That was 19 down through 23. But today, we're looking at how God's wrath is being revealed. And this is God's wrath of abandonment. When God pours out His wrath on mankind right now, He is doing so through abandoning them to their own sin. So we've looked at the why. Let's look today at the how. How is this wrath coming upon mankind? And the passage today, 24 through 27, gives us three steps. God's abandonment wrath is shown against all mankind in three steps of a downward spiral. So we're just going downward here as we go through this text. Of course, it's truth. We love the truth. We want to study the Bible. But it's not always the most uplifting, exciting thing to study the doctrine of sin. And yet here it is. And when we study it, we should come away knowing I was a sinner like that. God saved me. And I need to tell others about this. And whatever is going on out in the world, I cannot agree when they support sins that are listed in this passage. So let's dig in the three steps in a downward spiral. Number one, the lustful heart desires impurity. So Paul's already told us that mankind worships idols. They worship their self. They worship statues. They worship gods of their own making. And that leads to lustful heart desires which didn't lead to impurity. Look at verse 24. Therefore, God gave them over. And this is a verb, gave them over, that we're going to see multiple times in the rest of this chapter. It's a terrifying statement. God gave them over. You don't want that to be about you. You don't want to be described as God having given you over to something. This is where Paul starts to explain how the wrath of God is currently being shown to the world right now. He gave them over. Terrifying. Much more terrifying than you realize when you first read the passage. The word gave over here in Greek means to turn someone over to the authorities. It's the term that even secular Greek would use when someone was arrested and then handed over to the judge. Or the judge handed someone over to be punished by those who punished criminals. God is handing over mankind to a type of punishment. That's what it means to give over. It's a technical term in the ancient world for handing over to police or the court system. And so the writers of Scripture pick this up, and the translators of the Old Testament into Greek pick this word up, and they used it multiple times in the Old Testament. Leviticus 26.25, God says to the people of Israel, I will also bring upon you a sword which will execute vengeance for the covenant. And when you gather together into your cities, I will send pestilence among you so that you shall be delivered or given over into enemy hands. He's telling Israel that he's going to curse them if they turn from him and worship other gods. He's going to give them over to their enemies, to the Gentiles, to the pagans. Also in Judges 2.13, I mean, listen to the frightening way this is used. So they forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtaroth, the false gods of the Canaanites. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel and he gave them into the hands of plunderers. He gave them over. His own people who turned away from him, he gave them over. He sold them into the hands of their enemies, it says, so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Again, Judges 6.13, Gideon says... Now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian because they had turned away from God. That's the book of Judges. It's a cycle. Turn away from the Lord, be punished. Then they're brought back and restored. They turn away again. They're punished. And that's how the Lord does it. He gives them up to another nation who attacks them. So what is this? What is this giving over that God has done in human history and is doing right now in the world, according to Paul in Romans 1? What is it? How do we understand it? Well, it's not just God stepping back. You know, the God who wound up the clock of the world. 
And supposedly he just stepped back. That's what a lot of people believe. It's a moralistic, deistic view of God. That there's a creator God and he wants us to live rightly. So he just threw everything in the motion and now he's impersonal and he stepped back. And if you do something wrong, you'll suffer the consequences. But it's cause and effect, natural world. Well, that's not what this verb, this verse means here in the text. That's, that's more about deism and enlightenment worldview. No, the Bible says that God is active. He's personal. So every punishment that God brings, He is personally involved in that punishment. He's not just letting us go our own way, although that certainly happens in sin. He's actively handing over. He's actively punishing sinners that have not repented, that have not turned to Him. So He not only lets it happen by removing his hand, but he also initiates the punishment and maintains the punishment upon the world. This this is heavy. This is something that is a deep doctrine in Scripture that God doesn't just let sinners go on to see what happens, but he is actively punishing them through their life, and when their life ends, they go to eternal punishment. How important is the gospel How important is the true message of how to be saved if this is the case of all mankind? And it is. What God is doing is giving them over to a punishment. He's bringing his retribution upon sinners by sending them in the direction they want to go. They're a boat and they're anchored on a fast flowing river. And if that boat was to be let go, it would go over the waterfalls. And the person on the boat just hates the one holding it. They hate God. They hate God holding that boat. They're cursing God. They're denying God. And eventually, the Lord pushes the boat off into the river. And away it goes over the waterfalls. Frightening. Frightening, really, when you think about it. God is punishing sinners for them sinning by not honoring, not glorifying, not worshiping Him. In other words, God is a just judge giving people precisely what they deserve. Precisely what they deserve. One commentator said, religious degeneracy is penalized by abandonment to immorality. This is giving over by God into a sinful lifestyle. Now, he's not making them sin. God never makes people sin. The Bible's clear on that. He cannot sin. James 1.13, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. God's not making people sin, but he gives them over to go their own way, and they do indeed go into sin. That is the punishment. That is the abandonment and where it ends up. But God is holy. He is righteous. He is a holy and righteous judge, Doing exactly what he said he will do. This type of judgment is that God hands a person over to a punisher. So the the court system has made a verdict. Now the judge is handing that criminal over to be punished. To the people who will punish him. Well who is the punisher? It tells us right here. God hands them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity. Now, believers will often say, that's fine. That's wonderful. God, let me do what I wanted. That's what I want. No, look at at the punisher here. The lust of their hearts to impurity. To lust here is to strongly desire to have what belongs to someone else or to engage in an activity which is morally wrong. In other words, God has declared the verdict. You have turned away from me. You have sinned. And here's your punishment. You get the lusts of your heart. And those will lead you to impurity. God is not causing them to sin. They have a lust in their hearts. Their heart, the deep-seated desire, the place where the inner self is. And they long to do it. That's what a lust is. It's a strong desire to do something. And most often it's used in the Bible for a strong desire to commit sexual immorality. Now, sometimes people say, that's not fair. God's not being fair. Actually, it's completely fair and just because he is holy and righteous and just. And you would want every judge upon this earth, in our country, in our state, in our city, to send a criminal to be punished. 
You would not want a murderer to be let go. No one would say, well, you know, you really should let all those murderers go. I guess people say that today, you know. Unfortunately, that's where our world is. But a right-thinking person would not let a judge continue in their office who let all the criminals go. In fact, the, the whole police force would probably quit. And they are, I guess, in some cities. God is not unfair. And in fact, this is exactly what people want that are in this condition. Go to Ephesians 4.19 and you're going to see the same verb used in Ephesians 4.19. So God gives them over. What's He given them over to? To the lusts of their heart to impurity. And look at 4.19 of Ephesians. This is very similar text here. But now it's looking at it from man's point of view. And they, talking about Gentiles talking about pagans, they having become callous, hard-hearted, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. So who gives them over? Well, they, they give themselves over, but ultimately God is sovereign. He's sovereign over everything. A person can't give themselves over to punishment unless God sovereignly does it as well. So they choose to do it. They love to do it. They don't even understand that it's punishment. You try to talk to the world about sexual sin, and an unbeliever just hates that. They don't understand that it's a punishment that would anger them. And often, even though they feel a conviction for it, they don't want to hear it. They become callous. So this is a judge. God is a judge. He's handed over a prisoner to punishment for the crime that he has earned. And God hands sinners over to this terrible cycle now of ever-increasing sin. Don't find yourself caught up in this spiral because it's only going to get worse from here. These lustful desires of the heart lead to impurity, Paul says. Literally, impurity is any substance that is filthy or dirty, refuse. And figuratively, this word began to be used for, for filthy actions, moral corruption, and it almost always identifies in Scripture some sexual sin. Now, he's not yet gotten to homosexuality. That's coming up in 26 and 27. Right now, he's just saying all impurity comes from lustful desires of the heart. And God is handing mankind over to those desires, to those lusts. This is the prison into which they are delivered. Adultery, sex before marriage, fornication, drunken parties, prostitution, homosexuality, bisexuality, transgenderism, bestiality. We could just go on and on with the list. It's always seems to be growing, the different initials that people are willing to affirm. Mankind, all of us before we were saved, our conscience is really troubled by God's existence. Mankind doesn't like that there's a holy God who created and He's all-powerful. And so they rail at God. They complain at God and they run off into more sin so they can sear their conscience and heart even more. They say things like, leave me alone, God. Let me indulge my own sins without interrupting me. Just like a child who's playing and they don't want to be interrupted. And they get upset when mom and dad says, clean your room. And they'll even try sometimes to yell and scream at their parents about this. Well, how much more so with God when sinners just rail at the Lord? And God says, all right, I will abandon you. I will confront you no more about this sin. Go your way. It's frightening. Terrifying. That's why Hebrews 10, 31 says, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The Puritan Thomas Manton wrote, it may be the greatest expression of God's anger if he does not check us and suffer us to go on in our sins. He quotes Hosea 4.17. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. He says the word, providence, conscience, let him alone is what God is saying. He goes on to talk about Psalm 81.12. So I gave them up to their own heart's lust and they walked in their own counsels. He says, Manton says, it is the greatest misery of all to be left to our own choices. Where would you be, Christian? If you were left to your own heart desires. If God had not saved you. Would you even be alive here today? Would you be in jail? Would you be in prison? Would you have ruined your family? Your marriage? I mean praise the Lord if you're saved. We don't have to 
be concerned about where we would be. We know where we're at with Jesus Christ. Well, Paul continues in still in verse 24. The result of all this lust in the heart, which leads to impurity, the result of all this is so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. They dishonored God, so he's rightly given them over to dishonor themselves. They have distorted their view of God. Now they're going to have a distorted view of their bodies, a distorted view of sexuality and sexual desires. This is a lesson for all of us. We cannot deny God and think it has no practical relevance. This text is saying to all who read it, if you deny God, if you don't glorify the Lord, look where it ends up. Now you might say, well, I'm not a pagan. I'm, I'm faithful. I'm, I'm in Christ. And how many times does Paul in his other letters and later in Romans warn Christians not to fall back into these sins? How many times does he warn us over and over? Because we're all tempted to go back to those sins we committed before we were saved. We still have indwelling sin. We still have temptations dangling in front of us by the world, the devil, and even our own hearts. There's practical things that happen in your life when you go into sexual immorality, when you go into these relationships that are not godly. So that's number one. That's the first step. Now the second one, Paul says in verse 25, the second one is the exchange of the truth of God for a lie. The exchange of the truth of God for a lie. Actually, this verse is now going back and just summarizing what he said in 21 through 23. He's making very clear we understand why God's wrath is coming upon the world this way. Why? He says in verse 25, they exchange the truth of God for a lie. The truth of God. That's God's truth that he's revealed to us. He's made it clear that there is a God, that he's an all-powerful creator, that he is divine, that we should glorify him. In other passages, it's really clear that God gives us all good things, the rain that comes on the just and the unjust, the food that you eat, the children, marriage. All of these things are blessings to the believer and the unbeliever. And the unbeliever should at least thank and glorify God, and they don't. They denied him. And he summarizes idolatry basically by saying they exchange the truth of God, that God does exist. They exchange that for a lie, for the idols, for the idols, for their sins. Ultimately, they suppress the truth of God for a sin. They had a bag of diamonds. They threw them in the garbage disposal. I guess that wouldn't grind diamonds up, but they threw them in the trash. They got rid of them and they went out and got some dog refuse in the backyard and worship that. I mean that is not even close to the true exchange that happened. But think of how ridiculous that would be. We do not glorify God and thank God for who he is. Until we're saved. And so God has given them over. This is why he's doing it. They exchange the truth of God for a lie. James Montgomery Boyce summarizes this well. He says, ever since Adam's first rebellion in the Garden of Eden, man has wanted to get rid of God, to push him out of his life. In contemporary terms, he is saying, God, I just want you to leave me alone. Take a seat on that chair over there. Shut up and let me get on with my life as I want to live it. That is contemporary man. That is not just contemporary man, but man going all the way back to when Adam left the Garden of Eden. They just want God to be quiet. Have you ever had somebody tell you, don't throw the Bible at me? I don't want to hear that verse. Don't talk to me about Scripture. If you haven't, then you need to talk to more people about the Gospel, because it will happen. Paul says they also worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator. So that's the lie that they bought, that they wanted to buy, that they made up. Put the truth of God aside, throw it away. Let's buy the lie. And they are now worshiping and serving the creature rather than the creator. Instead of worshiping the one true God. The God of holiness, the God of goodness, the God of mercy, the God of grace. They worship idols. Either stone statues in ancient times or idols of the heart today. Today, I, I spoke last week about all the different ways that people worship money. They worship 
sex. They worship their body. They worship themselves and doing all of these things to themselves to try to get attention from others. They worship science. They worship achievement. They worship a job. They worship a house, car, all the material things in the world. That is worshiping and serving the creature, the thing created, rather than the one who made it, the creator. It sounds so simple. How could someone do it? But you know that all unbelievers do it. You know that you did it before Christ saved you. This is one of the major temptations of mankind. In fact, when Jesus was tempted by the devil, what did Satan say? He said, worship before me and all shall be yours. You can have all the kingdoms of the world, he told Jesus. You don't have to go to the cross. It will all be yours. I'll give it to you if you just bow down and worship Satan. And you know what Jesus says? It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. It's that clear. And all creation speaks to that. Because as Paul reminds us right in the middle of this passage... The creator is he who is blessed forever. Amen. I mean, look at Paul and the way he's preaching this. He's saying, here's all of this wrath being poured out. And here's the spiral. And right in the middle, blessed be the Lord forever. Amen. He's praising God. He's worshiping God. Even though the people that are going to read this someday won't like necessarily the message. Not all of them will read this and rejoice. Paul says God is good. God is blessed. We should bless him. We should praise him forever. And amen means let it be so. He is the one. He is the one we should worship. He is the true God. Let's not turn to idols as Christians. Let's not be tempted to go back to those things we used to worship. Want to impress everybody with the things we have, the way we look. Put things into our bodies, do things to our bodies to impress the world. Show parts of our bodies to people to impress them. Let's not worship man. Let's not worship ourselves. Let's not worship our things. But let us worship and glorify the one true God. And we can say amen to that, right? I mean, it's in the text. We can say amen, right? Even though we're not always an amen every verse church. We can amen that one. Thirdly, though, and this is the one we're going to spend some time on. Thirdly, the third step, the final step in this paragraph, and it's going to continue into next week's sermon, the the steps of the spiraling picking up again in verse 28. But just 26 and 27, the exchange of the natural for the unnatural. So they've been given over into their lustful heart desires, and that led to general sexual impurity. And Paul says in the second point that, look, This happened because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And now he's going to get very specific about what that wrath looks like. For this reason. Verse 26. For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions. I mean it's already bad enough. The lustful desires of the heart. And now he says degrading passions. He describes it another way here. This is the same giving over that we saw earlier in verse 24. He's just now getting more specific And showing us how bad these lusts of the hearts go. How far they go. How deep they go. The degrading passions. These are lusts which degrade the body and the soul. This is scripture. This is what the Bible teaches. Now he defines what that is. He says here's the worst scenario that we see in the world. For the women exchange the natural function. Let's just stop right there. He says, this is how degrading mankind has gotten as God has handed them over. Even the women who are often the last to run into immorality in a culture. The men, they're the first. The women are the last. He starts with the women, I think, for that reason. Even the women have run off into this sin. Today we call lesbianism. The sinful exchange of homosexuality right here. They exchange the natural function. The natural function, the way that God created their body, the parts, the desires, all of that, that's a natural function that God has ordained, that God has created since Adam and Eve. And they exchanged it. Just like God, the truth of God was exchanged for a lie, now they're exchanging the natural function for that which is unnatural. You see there in verse 26, this is the Apostle Paul writing. And sometimes some people want to debate, well, this isn't Jesus 
He said in the red letters, now no, the New Testament is all Jesus coming through his apostles. One person was arguing with me recently, not in the church, but outside the church, that, well, those are the words of Paul talking about, we were discussing that women shouldn't preach or teach and have authority over men. As she said, those are the words of Paul. Jesus said, everybody should go into the world. And I said, the words of Paul are the words of Jesus through the Apostle Paul. There is no difference. And so these are the words of Christ through his apostles. This is how we ought to think of this. Unnatural means against nature. That's literally what it means. Against nature. Against the way God created that person. It's not, in other words, the way that God made those body parts. They don't work like that. It's so basic a child can understand it. It really is. It's not to, to make fun, but it is so basic that a child understands the body parts are different. And body parts work different. And some people say, well, you can't expect the unbelievers in the world to know this. They don't have a Bible. They don't care about the Bible. Uh, back when the Supreme Court case was going on, people said, you can't legislate morality. Well, you can't legislate all the sins of the heart. That's true. But what is legislation and punishment in courts if it's not a type of legislation of morality? When somebody murders another person, they are punished. There's a legislation against that immorality that has occurred. Well, that's beside the point I'm trying to make here, though. Paul is saying, look, the Bible isn't necessary for someone to know this is wrong because it's against nature. It's against the natural way that God made things. You don't need a Bible to tell you homosexuality is wrong. Did Sodom and Gomorrah have a Bible? Did Sodom and Gomorrah have a prophet sent by God? No, they didn't. And what did God do? He destroyed the whole city. Why? How could he do that? Did they not know the truth? No, they knew it because it's against nature. There's a natural way and people know what that is and they go against it and they were sinning as a result. You see, Romans 1, 18, all the way through the end of this chapter is describing Gentile pagans without the Bible. Paul already knows they don't have the Bible. He knows they don't have the gospel. He's telling the Romans, this is who you were before the gospel came. He already knows that. They're not punished for not having a Bible. Pagans are punished because they suppress the truth of God for a lie, which God then gives them over, and then they go into these sins. Not every single person that's a pagan will run into these sins, but he's saying this is an example of how bad it gets. And he says in verse 27, in the same way, also the men abandon the natural function of the woman. Now, I just want to stop here and tell you that the words for men and women are, are literally male and female. Because he's trying to recall the reader's mind, if they know the Old Testament, to the creation story. He could say men and women like we do in English. But he says male and female. Pointing back to Genesis 1.27. He's pointing them back to the creation event. The one that Jesus cited in Matthew 19.4. And he answered and said, have you not read... He who created them from the beginning made them male and female. There's only two. They're either male or they're female. And now he quotes, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's how it works. Man joined to woman and marriage, which is a wonderful place to express sexual desires, natural sexual desires for your wife or for your husband. But Paul says, those who deny God, they don't, they don't want that desire. They don't have that desire. They run from that and want to commit sexual immorality. Now he's describing homosexuality right here. Now look how he describes it. Burned in their desire toward one another. Their hearts were inflamed, in other words. They literally, the, the idea here is kindling. They just piled up this kindling and they set it on fire in their heart. And they burned for this sinful action. In other words, it's a matter of choice. It's not genetic. This is the proof text that tells you that. And it used to, people would argue that it was genetic. And all, all, supposedly all these studies. Now, though, they've moved away from that. And the world says, no, it's actually not genetic. Because if it's genetic, then you really struggle with the idea of bi and trans and all that. Because 
genetic doesn't explain that. So now it's sort of pick if you want it to be genetic or not. But all that aside, Paul is saying it's a desire that they're burning towards one another. It's a choice. It's a desire. And this language here is for us to understand it's the lust of the heart that leads to this sin. Even the attraction. Even same-sex attraction is a desire for something that's not natural. It's a desire for something that goes against what God's word says. It's a desire for sin. That's what Jesus meant when he said in Matthew 5, 28, I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The desire to commit adultery is a sin in of itself. Well, it's the same with same-sex attraction. And he says, men with men committing indecent acts. Look at the language. Indecent. Shameful is the idea here. Disgraceful. It's not something to be celebrated. It's a sin that needs to be repented of. It's a sin that if you're a Christian and you have these struggles, that need to be counseled with a biblical counselor. You need scripture applied. The Holy Spirit is in you as a Christian. Christ is in you. You can grow and overcome these sin struggles. But the unbelieving world, they've been abandoned. They've been left over. They've been given over to these sins. It's really clear in Scripture. Leviticus 18.22, You shall not lie with a male as one lies with a female. It is an abomination. Why? Well, because God said it's a sin, but also because it is against nature. It's against God's creation. 2013, If there is a man who lies with a male... As those who lie with a woman, both of them have committed a detestable act. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. In Israel, they were under a theocracy. They were under the law. And if they caught someone in this sin, there was no description, court case, any of that. They were stoned. Now in the New Covenant, we don't go around punishing people for sins. That's not our job. That is God's responsibility. He will do it. This text says he's actually doing it right now. But we are to tell people the truth. And Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither. And now he lists all of these sins, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, nor homosexuals. And you know what he goes on to say? Such were some of you. In other words, make sure you tell people they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God if they're in this sin. But you used to be like that. And remember, you came... From that place. And you were saved. And you were sanctified. And you were justified. He said. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Look at how clear scripture is on this. 1 Timothy 1.9. Paul's now writing to Timothy. And this is a bit later in his ministry. Than when he wrote Romans. And he's saying here. And verse 9, realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous person. In other words, don't go back to the law and try to earn your righteousness. You do that through faith in Christ. You get the righteousness of Christ when you are justified. But those who are lawless, the law is made for the lawless, the rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane. So he's got another list here. For those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and immoral men, and homosexuals, and kidnappers, and liars, and perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. That's why he says in Romans 1, they're indecent acts. He's not trying to hurt their feelings. He's not trying to get them upset. He says in God's sight, those are disgraceful acts. Now there's a lot of sins that God mentions that are disgraceful acts. But right now he's talking about homosexuality. And receiving, Paul says, in their own persons, the due penalty of their error. That's how he finishes out this discussion. He says they're receiving the penalty of their error already in their own persons. They've committed a great error. Literally, they wandered away from the path. What is the path? The path of the truth of God that he has created the world, that we should glorify him. But we haven't. We've been given over. If you're not in Christ, you've been given over to the lusts of your heart which has led for you to go against the natural function of the body. God created 
created man and woman to come together to be one flesh in marriage, to produce children, and yet they've gone completely against the created order. And they've wandered from the path. And, and really, the original here for this due penalty, the word due, the original is stronger. In other words, it's the necessary penalty. God had to bring this penalty upon them or he would be unjust. It was necessary. It must happen. What is the penalty? Well, some say this is AIDS, this is STDs. The problem is other people than homosexuals get AIDS. They get STDs. They get different health problems. So I don't think it's that. I think the text, the context, everything tells us that homosexuality itself is the due penalty. That is the penalty. God gives them over to it and a continuance in that lifestyle and all the sins that it builds up on their account is the judgment. It is the penalty. If you want to see a culture or a society that's worshiping idols, in other words, you just look and see how much is homosexuality running, how much is it running amok? How much is it in the culture? How much is it affirmed and loved in the culture? And he says, that's a culture that's worshiping idols. That's the connection he's making here. That's the argument. Look, the lost world is going to try everything to tell you this text doesn't mean what you saw that it means. Well, you can read yourself and see that it means. They're going to try to tell you and convince you That this passage and the other ones I cited don't actually mean what Christians have said for 2,000 years and the Jews have said for longer than that, that that's what they mean. That God is against this sin. They will want to convince you of a lie. The lie that says that it means something else. And that's what people do. When they want to convince you of a lie, they continue to tell you things so eventually you'll bite on one of those lures, you'll take the bait, And they'll have you. So they've thrown out all kinds of reasoning trying to dismantle this passage. Some say this is a kind of teaching that's not very loving. Others say this is singling out one sin while others get ignored. Which is interesting because he's going to have a long list of sins at the end of chapter 1. And we're going to look at all of those the same way we just looked at this one. People will say uh, others are just born this way. Other people will say, no, they're not born this way, so they can choose the way they want to live, leaving them alone. Others will say, there are many different interpretations of this text. Scholars have different understandings. People will say the passage is really just saying, don't go against your own nature. It has nothing to do with the way God designed us. Others will say, this is just temple prostitutes that Paul's talking about. This is pedophilia Paul's talking about. The world will even say, this is a hateful message. And even if it's in Scripture, we shouldn't talk about it and preach on it. Well, I'm not going to go through all of those objections that the world makes. I'll just touch on the last one, that it's a hateful message. It's actually a loving message. Because if someone is going the wrong way, is it hateful to tell them they should turn around and go the right way? If someone's going against traffic and you want to yell at them to turn around because they're across the highway and they can't hear you, so you're going to raise your voice, is that hateful or loving? See, no one says when they yell at their kid who ran out in the street and there's a car coming that that's hateful. We don't even have to yell. We just proclaim the message. We can preach the message. We can put it on our social media. We can talk about it with other people. Yeah, the world's going to say it's hateful, but it's actually very loving. And every sinner should be afforded compassion by believers, love, kindness. You're not going to win any converts by getting mad at them, getting angry, sinfully yelling at them, hating them. We should have compassion for the lost, kindness, respect, dignity. The Bible says they're still created in the image of God. They may have had that image distorted like we all have with the fall. They may be running from that and trying to distort it even more. But they're still made in the image of God. Hateful behavior, harassing behavior should never be seen from Christians toward those who are in sin. But we should show them love And we should take the message to them. I once picked up a guy who had been in prison. He was a young guy. He had been involved in drugs. And then I guess he he started worshiping Satan and committed all kinds of sexual immorality. And I was just transferring him because we knew the family somehow. And I was transferring him 
from where he got off at the bus stop downtown out to a friend's ranch to stay until his mom could come and get him. And he said, I got to talking about the gospel, and he said, look, you don't know, Pastor. You don't know all the sins I've committed. And I said, I don't have to know all the sins you committed. God knows them, though, and he will hold you accountable for them. He says, well, I can't be, I can't be forgiven. I said, have you ever heard of the Apostle Paul? You've grown up in a Christian home. You heard of the Apostle Paul? He killed Christians and enjoyed it until he was saved. Have you ever heard of all these people in the Christian faith who hated God and they were saved? They've committed abominations and they were saved. So I just kept trying to reach out to him. And I don't think he ever wanted to trust in Christ and he kept pushing back. But that's so true, isn't it? It's out of love that we proclaim the truth. If this church is going to faithfully proclaim scripture, we have to include the call to repentance. And it's not hate speech. It's not hateful or harassing behavior. I know often videos like uh, sermons like this get banned on YouTube and other places once they're discovered. But it is the truth. And we need to say it. In fact, Paul commands Timothy, be ready in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Now there's good news. There's good news. That's bad news, but there's good news for sinners caught up in this enslavement, caught up in this sin. Yes, God has handed over them to this sin. They're in this sin. They're enslaved to it. But Christ can break that enslavement. The Holy Spirit can break that. He can reverse that. He can change a person's heart. Sexual sin is not the unforgivable sin. Homosexuality is not the unforgivable sin, even though God calls it an abomination because it's not only a turning from God, but a turning from the way that God made human beings. It is not the unforgivable sin. Jesus made it clear that there's only one unforgivable sin, and this one is not it. If you would come to him for salvation, if you would turn to him, uh, if you're an unbeliever here today, if you would just come to him and call upon him to save you, if you would pray to him, if you would come and talk to someone after the service about your sin and about your repentance, and we could show you the glory of Christ right here in his word. But you don't even need to talk to us. Just turn to Christ. Just turn to Christ. Come to him. You can be justified like Paul told those Corinthians, some of the worst sexually immoral people in the Greek world. Corinthians. It was almost... It was almost a cuss word to say, you are a Corinthian. And he says, you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. Such were some of you, he says. You've been saved. So if anyone has received that forgiveness in Christ, they're a new creation. They're a new creature. They're a new creation. And now they're no longer in bondage to that sin. That's what we want to tell people. That's what we want to Tell them the bad news first so we can tell them the good news second. So let's take that message to them and not be ashamed of the truth of Scripture. Sometimes believers are ashamed of the Bible. Sometimes believers are ashamed of verses like this. Let's not do it because Paul says they need to hear the truth about sin. So let's pray that we might do that as a church. Lord, we thank you so much for the Bible. It clarifies our distorted thinking, it clarifies what we need to do, what we need to say, what we need to believe, how we need to live. And we know that Paul, he loved the Gentiles, that he went to these places and preached the gospel, not to condemn them. You condemn, Lord. Your word sometimes even condemns, but we just read it, we proclaim it, and we let you do the work in people's hearts. You are a mighty God. You can save. You will save. And I pray, Lord, that if anyone here today that is a believer is still struggling with these sins from their past, that they would get help, that they would seek counsel, that they would come to their pastors and seek to be discipled and counseled to fight against such temptations. We love you, Lord. We hold your truth above all things that the world says. And may we continue to do so in the name of Christ. Amen.